Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Jay Menon. I am Chief Scientist at Fungible, and we'd like to share with you our thoughts on next generation data centers. So here is the outline of the talk that I'm going to give today. I'm going to start uh, by talking about the challenges of current cloud data centers, and then I'm going to outline how these challenges are going to be addressed in the future. And then we'll talk about what that next generation data center looks like and what are some of the building blocks that go into making this next generation data center. So let's begin. I'm gonna start with the challenges that are uh, faced by uh, data centers of today. And there are five. Uh, there are five important data center challenges that we're going to talk about. First, Data centers take up too much power and too much footprint. And we're going to talk about why that's the case, but it's caused by uh, the fact that expensive resources like SSDs and GPUs and networks are heavily under, underutilized in today's data centers. And secondly, um, there is an increasing number of data centric tasks, tasks that require processing of high speed data streams inside data centers for which general purpose server cores are inefficient. And as a result of that, too much of the server cores are consumed in these tasks, leaving less uh, of the cores available for customer workloads. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that infrastructures are not agile. So you buy infrastructure for one kind of application, say machine learning, and then you can't really use the same infrastructure for something else, let's say VDI. And therefore you keep buying infrastructure uh, targeted at specific applications leading to many different silos. Number three is an explosion of SKUs. If each kind of application needs a slightly different kind of server, slightly different amount of storage, then you have all of these different kinds of servers and different kinds of storage that the data center operator has to go out and acquire, and therefore he does not get the economies of scale by buying a large number of servers, because every type of server, there's only smaller numbers of those that, uh, that one has to get. The fourth problem is that uh, security is a rising problem, and dealing with security is either expensive or not done very well. And the same is true of reliability. Um, so that's the fourth challenge. And finally, the fifth challenge is that uh, with all the complexity of today's data center, with all these different silos uh, and, and all of the connectivity uh, of the networks in the data centers, ensuring adequate performance is very, very challenging because anything, uh, many different things could be the bottleneck and finding where the bottleneck is and why their performance is not as good as it can be is, is a challenge. So those are the five challenges that we see today. And it's our belief that going forward, these will all get addressed. And all of these five challenges will, be, will get addressed. Um, and as you see, it's our belief that there are three key elements to addressing these challenges. The final solution of the next generation data center will have three key elements. They will have DPUs, our data centric processing units. We'll talk more about that, but DPUs in particular are very good at handling data centric tasks. And they're gonna be a key component of next generation data centers. And they'll be key to addressing these five challenges we've talked about. The second thing that's going to be key is disaggregation of expensive resources like SSDs and GPUs, disaggregation over the network, um, but it has to be done in a penalty-free way so that really you don't see the difference between whether that resource was local to the server or whether the, the resource is remote and disaggregated and pooled together somewhere else. So it has to be penalty free. So just disaggregation alone is not enough. It has to be penalty free. So that's the second key component. The third thing that, uh, that is needed is composability, being able to take existing silos of infrastructure and make it, make it suit the purpose of other applications. 
so that they are not siloed per, by application. And so this, this kind of dynamic composability is going to be key. So you'll see this, this mantra that I'll keep repeating, that there's going to be these three things. DPUs are important, penalty-free disaggregation is important, and composability is important. Now let's go back and see how these things address the five problems we just talked about. First, improved power and footprint and TCO. How do we get that? Well, if you do disaggregation and pooling of resources, then resources like SSDs and GPUs, not no longer tied to specific servers, can have much higher utilization. So you can go from utilizations of 15 and 20 and 30% to utilizations of 80 and 85 and 90%. So less is needed and therefore you get better power and better footprint. Secondly, you want to use these DPUs for these data centric tasks because they're much more efficient at these data centric tasks. This includes things like storage stack, the networking stack, the security stack. Um, and if you do that, then you take those tasks away from channel purpose servers that, they're, that are not efficient at these things. And once again, all of this power and footprint improves. And finally, you want better data center networking for the same reason. Today's data center networks are only about 20, 25% utilized. You wanna be able to drive that utilization up to 70, 80%. And once you can do that, that's also gonna improve the power. So that's how we're gonna improve the power and footprint going forward. We're going to enhance agility by using composability. That's going to be key. It, uh, you know, we absolutely believe the future is composable and it's very key to improving the agility and not having these infrastructures sit in their own silos. It is also key to reducing the number of SKUs because you don't have to buy a hundred different types of servers or three or four different types of storage boxes. Um, if, if these things are composable, then you'll be able to reduce the number of SKUs. Um, and that will give you economies of scale, uh, which will be very important. The DPU also is capable of enhancing the security and reliability. We'll talk about that. So the DPU is key to overcoming the fourth issue we talked about, which is that security is either weak or expensive. And finally, with respect to performance, the way you get good performance by using the right tool for the right job. Use CPUs where they're good for applications, Use GPUs where they're good for things like machine learning and use DPUs where they're good for things like data centric tasks. You do that, you do that properly and you're gonna get great performance. So this is our view of how these five uh, challenges are going to be overcome in the data center of the future. So now we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into DPUs because they're so key to the next generation data centers. And of course, uh, in my case, I know most about the Fungibles DPU, so we'll talk a little bit about Fungibles DPU, um, but we'll talk about DPUs in general and why they're important. So the uh, all of our offerings from Fungible are, of course, uh, powered by the Fungible DPU. Um, it's a new class of microprocessor that's purpose-built for this data-centric era where there are so many data-centric tasks. And there are two things that the fungible DPU is really good at. Number one, it takes these data centric tasks and it does them 10 times better than general purpose CPUs or GPUs. So they're really targeted at these data centric tasks. That's what the DPU does. So the goal would be to offload those kinds of data centric tasks from CPUs and move them to the DPUs and do them 10 times faster. There's a second thing that the fungible DPU does, and that is it implements uh, an endpoint for a much more efficient data center network. It takes standard networks, IP over ethernet, standard switches, standard tours, but if you have DPUs at the endpoints, you can drive the utilization of the data center network up to 70 or 80% without suffering any hits to latency. Um, and so that is very, very key to the next generation data center. So two things that the DPU does once more, makes data centric tasks 10 times more efficient and implements an endpoint for more efficient data center networks. Um, we'll talk a little bit about other DPUs in general. DPUs in general are used for offloading data centric tasks, but, um, but mostly they're not 10 times faster than general purpose CPUs often, they're about the same performance. They just offer you a way to offload the task uh, 
but but they're not 10 times faster. Um, ours is. Um, and then typically the other standard DPUs do not uh, do not address the problem of inefficient data center networks. So those are the two differences between uh, the fungible DPU and other DPUs. Here's another way of thinking about fungible DPUs and traditional DPUs. Um, really um, two key differences about why the fungible DPU is 10 times more efficient at data centric tasks. The first reason is because in the data, in the fungible DPU, the CPUs and the accelerators are very, very tightly coupled together. In traditional DPUs, you do have accelerated hardware, you do have um, CPUs, but it's a very loose coupling, which means that every time you have to interact between the CPU and the hardware accelerator, um, it's slow. Whereas in the fungible DPU, it's very, very fast. And the second uh, thing that differentiates the fungible DPU from traditional DPUs is that um, the CPUs inside of the DPU are really purpose-built for data-centric tasks, whereas in traditional DPUs, just general purpose CPUs are used inside, inside traditional DPUs. Um, and so this tight coupling comes from purpose-built memory systems. And, and, and then finally, uh, the fungible DPU has specialized accelerators that are themselves multi-threaded. So if you look at the figure at the bottom of the chart, the circles are the cores. Um, these are purpose-built for data-centric tasks. The squares are accelerators of various sort. Inside the fungible DPU, you have accelerators for compression, for encryption, for erasure coding, for regular expression, et cetera. Those are shown in different colors. The multi-threading is shown by the fact that these squares, there's, there's many of each kind of each color, um, as you can see in the picture. And so this multi-threading is very, very key. And um, to emphasize the fast interaction point between the CPUs uh, and the square accelerators, in the fungible DPU, it takes only 30 nanoseconds for you to go from a line of code running in one of those circles to running one of those hardware accelerators at the bottom there. Um, and um, so that, though, that, that's what really makes us 10 times faster at these data-centric tasks. On the right, you see a picture of a more traditional DPU. It's got some similarity to the picture on the left. You, there's, you know, it's, it's got an interface to the PCIe bus. It's got an interface to Ethernet. It does have some hardware acceleration and accelerated path. The difference is that as long as the work that you're trying to do is fits very well with that accelerated path, it will go very fast. But if it doesn't fit that path and things have to be done in the general purpose CPUs um, that are shown in the blue circles there on the right, then the slow coupling, the loose coupling, and the slow interactions are going to slow you down. So there can be a, a pretty steep uh, cliff in terms of drop in performance if the work to be done doesn't really match the accelerated path shown in the picture. Um, in the fungible DPU, because of the very fast interaction in 30 nanoseconds of, uh, to, to move, to, to hop from the, from the code in the circle to the accelerator, square that there is no drop off. Everything is, is fast. Um, and of course, as I have mentioned before, the fungible DPU does have one other very unique property, which is it can convert a standard IP over net ethernet data center network into what we call a true fabric. The benefits of true fabric are shown here in bulleted form on the right. The key things to focus on are that it avoids uh, congestion. Uh, so even at very high loads, like 70, 80%, uh, or even higher, there's no congestion on the true fabric. Um, you've got very low latency and very low jitter in particular. The graph shows how low the jitter can be. Um, you can see in gray that the 99th percentile latency is not very much worse then the average latency that is in contrast to traditional data center networks, which are more like the blue curve. And you can see that the 99th percentile latency is actually much worse than the average latency. This is all due to congestion 
And I think a key piece of what True Fabric does is avoid that congestion. There's also end-to-end -end security. Uh, everything is encrypted in a True Fabric. It's got full cross-sectional bandwidth. It's very scalable all the way to 4,000 racks in a data center. Uh, and all based on open standards, IP over Ethernet. So this is a key difference between the fungible DPU and other DPUs. Um, nonetheless, um, I think DPUs are going to be critical to the next generation data center. So we've talked a little bit about what, what, the, what a DPU does um, and why it's going to be critical. So with that, let's talk a little bit about what are the key building blocks for next generation data centers. And we see three, we see three key building blocks. First, we need scale out storage that is DPU based. This is going to be our pooled storage. This is where storage is going to be disaggregated. Remember that disaggregation is a key component of the next generation data center. So the DPU based scale out storage is going to be very important. That's gonna improve the storage aspect of the next generation data center. There's also going to be DPU-based host cards. Um, these will plug into the PCIe bus on, uh, on standard servers, and they will handle data-centric tasks. They will offload work from the general purpose server. Um, and this is the way that we're gonna improve the compute part of the data center. And a third key component is the Composer software. We believe Composer software is going to be very critical uh, this is what is going to allow you to repurpose servers for other tasks and not have servers sit in their own silos. That's what the dynamic composition is going to achieve for us. That's going to improve the entire data center. So those are the three key building blocks. And, you know, as uh, I'm going to repeat the fact that the three components that are going to be important um, to the solution are DPUs, penalty-free disaggregation and composability. Now, so let's talk about each of these three building blocks. Uh, so first is the DPU-based scale-out storage. Um, these are the key requirements that customers share with us about what is needed in block storage uh, for next generation data centers. The need to pool the storage, the need to get very, very high performance um, once, if you can get very, very high performance, you can effectively get the penalty-free disaggregated storage, which is really key to next generation data centers. You know, if you disaggregate the storage, but you suffer a lot in performance rel relative to local storage, then that's not good enough. It has to be in our, as, as, you know, as penalty-free as possible. In other words, performance of the remote storage has to be equal to the performance of local storage. Of course, you want it to be scale out in that this is what cloud data centers are about. You want to grow as you need and pay as you grow. You want compression and encryption. Both are very important and you want to do those at line rate. That's going to improve your TCO. That's going to allow for uh, workload, uh, for workload consolidation by, by allowing uh, different tenants to have uh, different encryption keys. Uh, Multi-tenancy is going to be uh, clearly important uh, for these uh, storage uh, devices. Uh, that's how you get workload consolidation. That's how you reduce the number of SKUs of storage boxes, because uh, otherwise for every kind of application, you'll need a different kind of storage box. So what, um, what the requirement really is that on a per tenant basis or per a, a volume basis, you want to you want to provide different protection schemes, uh, different encryption keys, and different quality of service because different workloads have different needs. If you can do that, then you can support multiple kinds of workloads and get the workload consolidation. All of this should be managed with REST APIs for managing petabytes and petabytes of data in a data center. That, that gives you good TCO. You want rack scale resiliency uh, with very low overhead. Typically storage does this by making two or three copies of the data. This is very, very common in cloud data centers today. High performance storage is replicated two or three times uh, just to achieve this kind of resiliency. Um, but the requirement that we have found is that people want the rack scale resiliency, but they don't wanna pay the overhead of a a second or a third copy of the data. And so 
trying to do that using some form of erasure coding across the network is a key requirement that, that we have discerned from talking to customers. Um, and the benefit, of course, is that you get the very high reliability at much lower cost. And finally, you want to be able to support workloads of every flavor and type, whether they run on VMs, whether they run on containers, whether they run on bare metal, that's important to workload consolidation. So those are the key requirements of cloud data centers. Now, why should I build this using a DPU? Um, because that's our, our premise is that next generation data centers must build storage with DPUs. Now, why do we say that? Because of the requirements that you see here, at least four of them highlighted in blue need a DPU. Without a DPU, you're not going to be able to get truly penalty-free disaggregated storage. Without a DPU, it's very hard to get line rate compression and line rate encryption. Um, and without a, a DPU with its uh, networked uh, capabilities and with its erasure coding um, hardware acceleration, it's not going to be possible to do rack scale resiliency with network to erasure coding. This is why you see pretty much every system out there in the world today that's built storage and does not use a DPU or uses replication, whether two copy or three copy in order to get uh, rack scale resiliency. So, um, so this is why in our, the, the blue lines in particular are why we feel that block storage of the future for next generation data centers needs to be built with data centric processors, DPUs. And this is our own uh, uh, implementation of a storage box using a DPU. The boxes that fungible builds are shown here on the right. Uh, each one of these boxes that you see is a 2U box with 24 SSDs inside of them. Um, and it does network erasure coding like we talked about. So all of the, all of the requirements are satisfied uh, by this particular implementation of DPU-based storage. It's got extremely high performance, um, low TCO uh, compression and encryption are run at line rate. It's, uh, it's very agile in that uh, for every volume that's created, you can specify what performance quality of service you want. You can specify how, how well you want it to be protected. Do you want it protected with four plus two erasure coding or eight plus two erasure coding? Um, all of that uh, is tunable by volume, um, uh, as is whether you want compression or not on that volume. So you get very high agility. It's all simple to manage because there is a, a separate control plane that you use for creating volumes. Uh, that's on the top, shown here on the top. Um, the three boxes shown on the top is a, a highly available control plane that you can use, uh, whether you're in a Kubernetes environment with a Kubernetes plugin, whether you're in an OpenStack environment with an OpenStack plugin, or whether you have your own cloud orchestrator and you just write to the REST API that's exposed by our control plane. All of that uh, is is managed through through this uh, uh, through this API, which makes it all you know managed easy to manage many many petabytes of data using that simple API. Now here's proof that DPU based storage can be very very fast. This is the performance of our own implementation of DPU based storage, the fungible storage cluster. Um, you can see that a single one of those nodes I showed you in the picture before with 24 SSDs in it can go to 15 million uh, four kilobyte IO operations per second or 75 gigabytes per second of bandwidth uh, when it operates as raw. Um, and then for different forms of uh, protected storage, whether it's erasure coded protected or mirrored, um, you can see the numbers here extremely high, you know, this is 15 million here for, with two nodes. Uh, this is 20 million here with six nodes, very high numbers. Um, you're going to be hard pressed to find these kind of numbers from anybody else. It's also very linear scaling of performance. 
Um, you can go up to 16 nodes so far that we have measured, and we don't believe it will slow down anymore after that, but we've measured uh, linear scaling. So DPU-based storage can be very, very fast, and can it be penalty free? So this is this is a proof point that DPU based storage and the fungible storage box is an example of that is in fact penalty free storage. So here we're running MySQL and we're comparing the performance of um, fungible storage uh, to that of locally attached storage. So you're comparing locally attached storage, which is in blue. Um, to remote and pooled and disaggregated storage, which is in orange, and it's on the other side of the network. As you can see, these uh, the y-axis here is latency, which means lower is better. And you can see that, in fact, um, we actually are, are totally penalty-free. In fact, the performance is uh, not just equal to, in, in many cases, it's actually better than that of local local storage so this is key being able to this is a real workload this is my sql um, being able to uh, disaggregate storage by disaggregation you get all the benefits of much higher utilization but it's penalty free i'm not losing performance by disaggregating that's the key um, and this is really a proof point that says yes you really can get penalty free storage disaggregation Storage on the other side of a network, if done properly, if done with uh, the kind of networking we talked about, if done properly with a DPU, you can get penalty-free disaggregation. This is the proof point of that. So that's a key component um, of the next generation data center. The second key component are these DPU-based host cards. And DPU-based host cards um, perform four functions. Um, First is they offload various kinds of network capability, like the TCP stack or uh, overlay networking, such as VXLAN, or the ability to do switching and routing like OVS. Those are all things that um, DPU-based host cards do. They also do uh, various kinds of security offloads, IPsec, SSL, TLS, stateful firewalls. These are all examples of things that a DPU-based host card does. It's very important. This is why it's very important for next generation data centers to use DPU based host cards, uh, because these are functions that would otherwise be done uh, inefficiently, I would say, on general purpose servers consuming cores that could instead go towards running real customer applications. Now, uh, standard, uh, you know, DPU based cards, uh, people call them smart NICs sometimes. Uh, really typically do the first two rows on this chart. Rows three and four are a little bit more unique to what uh, we do at Fungible with our DPU-based host cards. That's the reason we don't actually call them smart NICs, uh, because they do more than just networking or security. Uh, for example, they can do storage functions, such as um, being uh, a initiator and being able to storage initiator and offloading NVMe over TCP drivers work from, let's say, the Linux kernel running on the server onto the card itself. And that makes it much, much more efficient. Um, similarly, uh, with, the, with the card, you can do a remote boot. So therefore, servers don't need to have disks on them anymore for booting purposes even. Uh, you can always go to the remote disk, the disaggregated remote disk uh, for, for that purpose. Um, we also have a very, very unique feature that allows us to disaggregate GPUs from the servers and even um, move them to the other side of the network. Just like storage can be moved to the other side of the network and disaggregated in a penalty-free way, uh, the same is true for, uh, for GPUs. With a fungible DPU, it's possible to do penalty-free more or less uh, GPU disaggregation as well. I'm not going to talk a lot more about that, but like I said, you know, this is why DPU-based host cards are important. All of these are functions that we can offload from the host servers. Uh, many of the DPUs out there can do the first two rows. The rows three and four are a little bit more unique to what Fungible can do. Uh, just a little bit more detail on one of the three, the row number three on the previous chart, which is 
what what uh, what the storage initiator capability on a DPU based host card. Um, this allows remote network storage to actually appear local. So um, it just it just looks to the server like the disk is local. Uh, you can't tell the difference. It just looks like an NVMe local drive, even though it's really on the other side of the network. And um, you end up um, with the server cores that were running NVMe over TCP. All of that gets freed up. Applications can use those. Um, and then applications can run either in bare metal or they can run on virtual machines. But with the card, applications that run on virtual machines have the same performance as bare metal. Uh, as if they were running on bare metal. Uh, furthermore, with the DPU-based host card, as you can see in the picture here on the right, you could actually start compressing the data as soon as it leaves the server, because this is the host-based DPU. You start the compression here, you can start the encryption here, and then you can send it over the network down to the DPU-based storage. So you get the ability to do end-to-end -end compression and end-to-end -end encryption. And finally, we do have the capability of supporting diskless servers because we can do remote boot off of uh, images stored here on the remote storage. Um, now, uh, of course, Fungible also makes host cards. Uh, we make three different kinds. Uh, this is a two by 25 gig card. This is a two by 50 gig card here in the middle. And here on the right is a two by 100 gig card. Um, for networking functions, we can do north of 35 million packets per second. Um, for storage, we can do north of 2 million IOPS. In fact, most recently, we've been measuring 2.5 million IOPS per card. So if you had four cards in the system, um, we have measured 10 million IOPS uh, from, from four cards. So, uh, so that's the second key component, is the host-based, DPU-based host cards. Now, the third key component uh, for next generation data centers is Composer software, because this is what gives you true agility. Um, and so here is what Composer software uh, of the future is going to be able to do. Now, of course, in, in Fungible's case, we have, we have our own Composer software, but we're here in this talk talking about next generation data centers. Composer software is going to be very important. Uh, first, it's going to be able to host and isolate multiple tenants. This is key. I think all future data centers, cloud data centers must support multi-tenancy. So we'll have multiple tenants. And then within each tenant, and what I show in the picture here on the right is what, what the Composer software can do for any one tenant. It's not showing the multi-tenancy aspect here. It's showing a single tenant with multiple workloads. And so uh, in this particular picture, the servers are here on the left. The servers have these DPU-based host cards, as you can see, each server has that DPU-based host card. You can see a pool of disaggregated storage here on the right. Um, that is our DPU-based storage pool. Uh, we also have a GPU pool. And what this is showing is that the composer can um, uh, very easily, in the matter of a few minutes, create these virtual data centers or uh, workloads, carve out the resources for any particular workload. So if, the, if it's a data science workload, like the one in light blue, um, we can uh, uh, assign to that workload a small amount of storage and a large number of GPUs because that's important there. Um, for the uh, for a data lake workload, on the other hand, doesn't need very many GPUs. So you can see the purple the purple uh, workload is using a small amount of GPU. Um, and there's also the data warehouse, which uses larger amounts of storage and doesn't really need a GPU at all. So um, so within within a tenant, the uh, composer software is able to carve out these workloads very, very dynamically. And, and this, is, this, is, this is why um, we don't need these silos because I don't really need to, to have servers of many different flavors and types. In fact, these, all of these servers can be diskless. All of them can be GPU-less because really DP, uh, storage is coming from the network. GPUs are coming from the network in this picture. Um, Composer software, therefore, uh, are provisioning these workloads. Um, it also supports role-based access control. 
um, if you're a tenant, you can have uh, access to your part of the data center. And then there's a data center administrator that can uh, manage the infrastructure for all the tenants. Um, physically, a, deep, a next generation data center therefore might look like this. You've got DPU-based storage at the bottom. You've got servers with DPU-based host cards. And then you've got Composer software. In this picture, it's shown running on three servers for high availability. So physically, that's what a, a next generation data center might look like. DPU-based storage is very important. Uh, the DPU-based host card is very important. And the Composer software is very important, all three things. Um, logically, this is really what we're talking about. So logically, you've got these diskless, GPU-less servers with host cards. You've got DPU-based storage sitting on the other side of the network. You've got DPU-based GPU servers sitting on the other side of the network. Um, and then connecting it all, you've got a standard IP over Ethernet network that has been enhanced to create a true fabric using DPUs on, on, every, uh, on all the servers and all the storage. Uh, that's the thing that lets you avoid congestion. It lets you have very low tail latencies with end-to-end -end encryption and end-to-end -end error control, um, as a result of which this network can now be driven up to 70, 80% utilization versus the traditional 20, 30% utilization. And so um, now uh, what you're able to get is remote storage with local storage performance. You're able to get remote GPUs with local GPU-like performance. And, um, uh, and of course you get very good utilization of the storage because it's all pooled and shared across all the servers. You get very good utilization of the GPUs because those are also shared um, across all the servers. So that's a logical picture of what the next generation data center looks like. Um, so these are the benefits uh, really and how the if you remember right at the beginning of the talk, we talked about five challenges. And really this is summarizing how these next generation data centers address those same five challenges. How do we solve the power and space problem? Well, by disaggregation of storage and network and GPUs, you get much higher utilization, therefore you need fewer resources. And the just-in-time composition of composability also allows you to meet workload requirements with little waste. You get agility through the composition because you can just redeploy resources across workloads in minutes to handle the hot spots. Um, you reduce the number of SKUs, again, really through composability. So you really don't need every kind of SKU um, to go out and buy every kind of server SKU or every kind of storage SKU uh, because of composability. You get better security and reliability through the hardware accelerated security domains the fine-grained segmentation VPC, the idea of line rate encryption built into the DPU, the rack level resiliency that becomes possible with network erasure coding. All of these things contribute to strong security and reliability. And finally, of course, uh, performance. You get very high performance because you're offloading data-centric tasks to DPU-based cards that were designed to run data-centric tasks you got a very high performance DPU based storage and you got very high performance networking because of the true fabric that again, DPUs give you. So really, as you can see, it's the same five challenges we talked about pretty much on slide one. Every one of those have been dealt with, with this combination of three key things. So just to summarize our view of next generation data centers, and I hope I've convinced you that these three things are essential to next generation data centers. DPUs are essential because that's the way to efficiently handle data centric tasks wherever you use them. You need penalty free disaggregation. You need DPU based storage, you need DPU based host cards. The combination gives you penalty free disaggregation of storage and of GPUs. And finally, you need composability software because this is the way you're gonna eliminate or reduce all of the different infrastructure silos. That's our view of next generation data centers. We, of course, at Fungible are building this vision um, and we have products today that satisfy this vision of tomorrow. 
So I look forward to your questions. It's been wonderful to talk to you today. And thank you very much. <laughs>